Hi, I'm Femi OK. I'm Malika Bilal, and you're in the stream. Today, we're diving into a show that you, our community, pitch. We're going to be focusing on the Southern Kaduna killings, and we'll chat with those in the middle of a class between farmers and herders in Nigeria, and why some believe it's more than just a land dispute. Deadly clashes between Christian farmers and Muslim nomadic herdsmen in southern Kaduna, Nigeria, are reviving concerns about a long-standing conflict over land resources. The farmers say the herdsmen are trespassing on their land and destroying their crops by grazing cattle. But some people believe the conflict is fueled by ethnic and religious tensions. Meanwhile, the Nigerian government is being criticized for not doing enough to curb the violence. Critics say President Muhammadu Buhari is more responsive to attacks on oil pipelines than people. Here's how the satirical show Keeping It Real with Adiola skewered the government. When militants were bombing pipelines, you did not waste time, Mr. President, to send battalions to go and get them under control. Those ones were bombing pipelines. They were not killing people. These Fulanis are killing human beings. Unless you're trying to tell us that the economy of Nigeria, you know, the oil is more important to you than the Nigerian people. Sure, you understand? I said, don't beg me. Yes, yes, I know that he eventually deployed the army to Kaduna, but what took him so long? Honestly, I'm really tired of all these politics that we are playing in Nigeria while people are dying. So how can Nigeria find a peaceful end to this conflict? Here to discuss this from Kaduna, we have Nasir El Rafai. He's the governor of the state of Kaduna. Endi Kato, she's a human rights activist living in southern Kaduna. And Mohamed Bello Tukur, he's a lawyer representing Nigeria's Cattle Breeders Association. And he previously worked with Nigeria's National Human Rights Commission dealing with this very conflict. Mohamed Bello, let me show you this. When we were talking to our online community, we said to them, what is important? What is making story in the news in your part of the world? Escobar said, genocide in southern Kaduna. Then we shared a story that got so many shares from Global Voices. Here's the question for you. Is the world ignoring possible genocide in southern Kaduna in Nigeria, Mohamed Bello? How would you respond to that? I, I, I think, I think uh, people who are referring to it as, as genocide don't even understand what is happening in that situation because uh, I have a little knowledge about what genocide is. I've had the benefit of uh, visiting Rwanda, you know, visiting the genocide memorial, interacting with uh, key scholars on genocide, and I know what it means. Uh, what we are having in Southern Kaduna, like you said in your introduction, you know, we have a situation that relates to the aspect of conflict between two uh, user groups, you know, the farmers and the herders on the one side. Then you also have, you know, the interplay of ethnic and religious politics there. Then you also have the other aspect that has to deal with banditry. And then you have people who are trying to exploit the situation for political purposes. That is what is happening in Kaduna. But obviously, like we said earlier, you know, the media is absolutely biased. You know, they have a victim now that they want to paint as a, a violent person, you know, and then use it to, for political purposes to either to haunt the administration or to haunt the others. Huh. You know, this is uh, rather unfortunate. And I think it is not the situation that is happening in Southern Kaduna. I know the history very well. Andy, when that genocide word comes up, it's not used lightly in Southern Kaduna. Is it an appropriate word to use? Well, it is. I mean, it's, um, it's not just Southern Kaduna. When you make it look like uh, telling people to stop killing other people is victimization, I think that is some sort of bullying and contribution to the genocide itself. It's not just Southern Kaduna, it's Plato. It's tribes in Plato states, tribes in Taraba, in Benue, in Nasarawa. And there's one common character in all these killings. It's headsmen, Fulani headsmen. So when you see the media is being biased, what, what is the media supposed to say that they are not killing or that bodies are not falling by the day? I do not understand. We are dying almost every day. We have, if, if they are not attacking villages, we're having loan attacks. Um, we're also having cases where women are being torn open and their babies ripped out of their wombs and slaughtered. What do you call that? I, I, I don't know what other word to call it. This is, these are people out to wipe out people. And I hear that really tragic stories that you you told us there but there is someone who says it's still not a genocide in his person's view uh, uh, this person on, on twitter tizan says we've had clashes 
between Fulani and other tribes, but it's not a genocide. But what those clashes look like, this is detailed here in this tweet. This person says, as usual, no one knows exactly how many victims of these attacks there are. No one knows their names or the families that they've left behind. Governor, can you give us some insight, whether it's a genocide or not a genocide in your view, but can you give us an insight on who's being killed and who's doing the killing here? Well, um, I think both sides are killing one another, uh, which is unfortunate. I think to time it as genocide uh, is uh, stretching it. Uh, genocide is a much bigger scale of deliberate and uh, organized killing. This is not what is happening here. Uh, what is happening is that over the years, for the past 36 years, this kind of uh, unfortunate events have been taking place in southern Kaduna. Uh, the, right from the first uh, uh, ethnic and religious clash in Kaswa Magani in 1980, we've had eight or nine such clashes all around Kaduna State. This is the legacy we inherited. This is not something that you can understand by taking a snapshot of one event. Uh, for me, as state governor, my duty is to ensure the security of lives and property of everyone. And those that uh, talk about genocide or reduce this to a conflict between religions or between ethnicities, I think are not doing justice to the people of Kaduna State and are being unhelpful. See, we have, uh, Gov Governor, may I, share, opinion, may I share something with you? Because just so that our international audience can keep up with this conversation, the Nigerian Senate set up a committee to probe the killings that have been happening in southern Kaduna. This is what the president of the Senate said. I will not idly sit by and watch innocent Nigerians being killed on the basis of their religion, ethnic group or political persuasion. He is contradicting what you just said. Yes, he is contradicting what, I'm, what I've just said because he doesn't have the responsibility to govern. He is heading uh, the Senate uh, and uh, they debate and they are politicians. Uh, I am here uh, governing a state, a very, very pluralistic state, diverse state, and it is my duty to try to get everyone to live together in peace. This kind of rhetoric from politicians is what has aggravated the situation in southern Kaduna. Uh, Bukola Saraki, the Senate President, knows, he's old enough to know, that we have had seven or eight rounds of violence of this type in southern Kaduna in the last 36 years. And to give it ethnic or religious coloration is completely missing the point. I will not lead to a solution. It is my job to find a solution. It is his job to continue debate. And we can disagree there. So as we look for a solution, uh, people online are reminding us that we need to know why this is happening in the first place. And there's a few different theories out there. This is Juliet. She says, the government is ignoring the root issue. It's a fight for scarce resources of arable land, and that's now morphed into unfettered religious and tribal domination. So that's her view. There is a slightly different view, though. We got a video comment from someone named Cham Bagu, and he says, this isn't about religion. This is just about the land. Have a listen. The violence in the southern part of Kaduna of Nigeria is basically a struggle over scarce land resources. Uh, this conflict has uh, taken a religious dimension and uh, I do not think that that is fully correct because in the northwest of Nigeria we have a Muslim uh, Fulani bandits who are killing and stealing cows from Muslim Fulani headsmen. And therefore, I don't think that there's an issue of religion. So, Indy, what do you make of that comment from Chom, who's coming to us from Search for Common Ground, Nigeria? Well, um, in, in terms of um, what is happening around people saying um, is um, scarce land resources, I don't see how scarce land resources will automatically lead to the death of so many people. <laughs> I mean, there's so much land in southern Kaduna, and not all of those lands are being found upon or being herded upon. In fact, the land in which they are hiding right now, some of them are, are, not, are not farms. We have a lot of hills and valleys. The same with places like Plitu and Nasarawa. There's a lot of land everywhere for them to graze. And we wonder why you leave that land and come and kill people. There's really a lot of land you have to go to these places and see. 
um, Southern Kaduna is made up of a lot, a lot of hills and, and, and valleys in between. People do come to hike well, there. So when you see Scotland, I is, want to understand the, the, the conflict, the coming the, sorry, that, okay, the conflict not, in Southern Kaduna your, your is not not between Andy, and Andy, not heard. And the Andy, one solution Andy, hold tight for a moment. Andy, for your Andy, this is Femi speaking. Andy, hold tight for a moment because you're asking a question that Mohamed Bello is very qualified to answer. Mohamed, go ahead. Okay, what I am saying is the conflict in Southern Kaduna is not between transhuman pastoralists and the indigenous there. The conflict there is between certain herders who are there and, uh, you know, the farmers who are there. And I think I will agree with Tom in what, in what he said. But, and I think I will just add that, you know, it has metamorphosed into an ethno-religious conflict because I know this conflict. The governor had earlier mentioned it. I started witnessing this conflict. The first one I witnessed was in 1987. I was in part one in the university then, and then subsequently settled here. And I have witnessed all of it along in 2011, which was the worst that has happened. And now it is happening again. Why is it happening like that? I can tell you one incident. In, 20, in 2014, the federal government organized a conference, you know, organized a, a conference to address this issue. At the last moment, at the last day, the conference had the vice president in attendance. It had all the service chiefs in attendance. It has all the security chiefs in attendance. You know, at the last moment, Sokapu decided to withdraw. We asked them, why are you withdrawing? If you have a problem with the hardest in Southern Kaduna, come and table it before the highest forum in the land. Why are you withdrawing? Why are you always withdrawing into ethnic shelves and then playing politics with lies of people, Mohammed playing Bello. politics with their properties, Withdrawing playing politics, you know, just to advance political causes. Mohamed Bello, very, like, I, 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 a, yes, lot yes. The, a lot of the, a lot of the, a lot of the issue. Hold tight for me, me a minute, uh, Andy. Is a lot of the issues are what do we do about the Fulani herdsmen? What are the Fulani suggesting? No, think, is, no, is, no, no, no. What, what are the Fulani suggesting that you're representing? What, what are they suggesting? What do no, they want to do? I, I think, How do they resolve the situation? Mohamed Bella. No, you are now ethnic profiling. They are full and just like Chum said, who are sure. losing their lives. They are losing their property. Their children are also killed. You know, nobody calls them Fulani when they are killed. Uh -huh. Nobody calls them Fulani when their properties are destroyed. Nobody calls them Fulani when their children are being are, are, are internally displaced camp. You know, this is a tit for tat situation, like the governor said. And I think it is wrong to begin to qualify people in terms of their ethnicity. If we are going to do that, how many ethnic groups in Southern Kaduna you will begin to play along to say that, oh, no, sorry, it is Baju against uh, this other one. Which it brings, is this other one. Brings, why are you which brings me to the question. Why are you which brings me to the question. Why if you are say, if you, you say um, it is tit for tat, if you say it is tit for tat, and one tribe in Southern Kaduna kills Fulani people, why are they killing every tribe in Southern Kaduna then? Why are they attacking several villages? Secondly, you cannot have I, peace without I, justice. You know, I think it's, 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 it's counterproductive for you to keep calling our people. So, Mohamed, it's whole time for a moment because I can't hear you and Andy, so let's just take time. I think it's counterproductive to keep calling our people to come for these meetings where we discuss peace. And right after we discuss peace and sign whatever agreement they make us sign every time, we go back home and these attacks continue. After a while, you start to get tired. There is no peace without justice. You can keep calling us to speak for meetings that do not stop the since, killing of since, our people. Since, it's it's not productive. At this is point, it, I would say it's it mysterious. Mohamed Bello and Andy, Mohamed Bello and Andy, just give me a pause for a moment because we have a lot of people who are watching you speaking. Andy, give me a pause for a moment. Andy. So many people watching around the world who want to be part of this conversation too. Just allow them to be part of that. Ma uh, Malika, please So, Femi, I think there is a common thread amongst comments online, even if they are on opposite sides of this divide, and it is that the federal government has not done enough to insert its voice. Uh, this is Kevin who says, government has never spoken against the carnage perpetrated by the herdsmen because they are his tribesmen, uh, referring to uh, Mohammed Buhari, of course, the president. On the other hand, there are people who say, what about local government? We got this tweet from Dunlandi, and I will uh, refer this to you, Governor, because uh, they're tweeting it to you. Uh, why is it uh, that Ed Rufai paid the Fulani herdsmen who killed and maimed the Southern Kaduna people rather than prosecuted them? And they're, they're re referring to, uh, I think when you came into office, you reached out to some of these herdsmen and offered them compensation is what people are saying online. Can you clarify that for us? Yes, um, as I... It, you know, I, I, I will respond to both tweets. I think first, those that are making the comment that the government has not done enough are not being fair. As soon as this conflict broke out, the uh, deployment from the first division of Nigerian army based headquartered in Kaduna 
moved to southern Kaduna. That's why the damage was limited. It could have been much worse. Indeed, this conflict is perhaps the least destructive in terms of lives and property compared to previous conflicts. The last one we had in 2011, at least 800 people were killed. Uh, thousands of people were displaced and property de destroyed. So those that are making this comment simply because of the coincidence that President Muhammad Buhari is a Fulani or Nasir Arufa is a Fulani are not helping matters. That is not the point. Secondly, uh, when we came into office, we inherited these problems uh, uh, at uh, communities in southern Kaduna being attacked. And we set up a committee under a very respected general, former chief of the Nigerian army, to look into it. And one of the things they found was that a lot of what was happening were reprisal, revenge killings from pastoralists coming from other African countries, our neighbors. And Governor, uh, which, uh, which Governor, Africa, Governor, which African countries are you talking Niger, about? Niger, Cameroon, Chad, Mali, Senegal, and as far as Guinea Conakry. Uh, uh, Governor, let me just as you, as you uh, speak, I'm going to show. I'm actually going to show people a map of Nigerian states, problem. and let me just show you where Kaduna yes. is here. If you have a look at this Nigerian states here, this is where Kaduna is here. So you are saying, Governor, the people are coming from outside of Nigeria all the way yes. here to create trouble. Yes. No. Let, let me explain what yes, yes and no. Yes and okay. no. Yes it can't, it, it, how can it be yes and no? Okay. Let, 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 let me explain. Uh, Please. The, can I yes, come people are coming Andy, from Andy, let the governor explain, countries. but he's going to do it swiftly. Please, governor. Oh. Yes, people who are coming from these countries and carrying out revenge killings in response to what happened in 2011. Now, Nigeria has signed on to transhuman pastoralist protocol of the ECOWAS allowing uh, pastoralists to come from neighboring countries uh -huh. along okay. international stock routes. There are, there are international stock routes that have been designated back in the 50s and 60s that these pastoralists follow through. They come in looking for grass, and then when the rains start, they go back to their countries. This is an annual ritual. Now, the conflicts arise because some of these international stock routes have been overtaken by urban development, and uh, agriculture. And when these pastoralists come with their cattle and they encroach into farmlands that used to be, mm. or that were designated international stock route, that was the, that's the basis of the conflict. Now, in 2011, when these international uh, pastoralists, uh, I would like to call them, were going back with their cattle in April, they were caught up in the post-election violence of 2011. There was a very bad post-election violence in 2011. At least 800 people were killed in southern Kaduna. Some of them were international pastoralists, and they were coming back to uh, engage in reprisal killings. All right. Now, Governor, I'm, I'm going to speed you, I'm gonna speed you up because, unfortunately, we don't have the time to, to do all of the history for this matter. So I'm just going to ask you to pause in thought for there for a moment because we have more community who want to speak to you. Hold tight for a moment, Governor. So the governor is explaining how international uh, herders made it into Kaduna and, and what that grazing looked like. There are a few solutions that we have from our community on what should happen in the future so that this doesn't happen. Uh, this is one person who says ranching is the solution. In this modern day and time, migrating animals for food doesn't make economic and safety sense. We also got a solution uh, in a, via a video comment. This is Ruben Buhari out of Kaduna, Nigeria. And and he explains what he thinks should happen. When it comes to the issue of grazing the reserve, we in Southern Kaduna, we've said it, you know, not once, not twice, that putting in, bringing in grazing the reserve in Southern Kaduna is, 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 is like provocation. Uh, these are people who are agrarian. These are people who are completely farmers. They don't have any business uh, rearing cattle. So why will you come in? and put grazing reserve in their area. We've said it not once, not twice. Take the grazing reserve to areas, to peoples whose culture has to do rearing cattle. But government has not done that, you know. Uh, so it's so unfortunate that uh, we are in these situations where life has become so valueless. We're in these situations where uh, people cannot even sleep with all their eyes closed. So Mohamed Bello, he basically, Ruben is saying, these grazing areas are in the wrong place. 
No, I think Ruben, with, with due respect to Ruben, he doesn't understand what is happening. Those grazing areas were not created by this government. They were not created by the previous government. Those grazing areas were created in 1965. They were not created yesterday. They were not created by this government with, with, with respect to the governor. You know, these grazing areas have been there. And these pastoralists, you know, the agro-pastoralists who are sedentary there, they have been there since, you know, since times immemorial. Those Fulanis have been there. Now, talking for the person who talked about ranting, I don't know whether that person knows what is ranting about. You know, you can have separate, you can have different sets of agricultural production. But if that person has had the benefit of keeping maybe two cows in his house and he has to feed them like all around the year, then he will understand what he is talking about. Because, you, you know, we are not insisting. If a person has the ability to maintain a ranch, he can have a ranch. But if the grazing areas are there, they have been there, they have been created by law, they have been designated, the corridor have been there now is just at, for at people to be there you know, people are saying okay look they should be uprooted about, how can it be you know, and, and to give me, give me a moment because i can't hear you mohammed bella so you okay oh, uh, what, let, what let what me just hear andy operating let me just hear andy's response to you andy go ahead okay okay please. yes andy i'm i'm saying he's so passionate about these animals and giving excuses but if we are having Whatever agreement was made in the 60s and, and is now affecting human life, I think that agreement has, has run its course and should be obsolete. You cannot try to pursue something that puts our lives at risk. If ranching is the answer, so be it. We will not feel safe if there are grazing results in our areas because it has been shown time and again that we do not make sure with these people and each time they are around our lives are safe. You, you cannot talk so passionately. There. You cannot talk so passionately about, oh, it's so difficult for them to ranch. Well, how easy is it, is it for us to die? And then in terms of, um, you, you sound very passionate about this. Um, See, you are mixing this uh, Defending Mr. Governor. Um, I am them. seeing blames on all sides. Um, you would let me talk, please. Thank you. Um, I'm seeing blames on all sides. Mr. Governor has called people who are complaining about dying and being at the danger of dying as talking irresponsibly. He has also said the Senate president is just a politician. I do not think that Mr. Governor was appointed. He's a politician, too. Um, the Senate president has realized that the life of every Nigerian matters, and if such an issue comes up, He's trying to find a solution and not just all this talk here and there. It, it is the life of the Nigerian. And I'm also concerned with, oh, it didn't start with us. It started with other, other governments. It was worse in, in 2014. What are we trying to say here? That, oh, I am failing at protecting the lives of people, but my failure is not as bad as the failure of 2014. Okay, I so, so Andy and Mohammed, I, no I want to show our viewers no who are watching and following this conversation. Andy and Mohammed, just give me a pause for a moment because we're hurtling towards the end of this show. I then will take you to the post show. But I, I want to remind people what we're talking about. And Andy, you were talking about the fear um, and, and daily feeling afraid in parts of southern Kaduna. Let me show you some of the pictures that you shared with us here um, and then show them to the governor. Governor, I'm sure you've seen these. These pictures have been circulating since December the 24th. How many people have been displaced from this current crisis? If you put a number on it, what is the official number that you feel comfortable sharing with us? Governor. Uh, yes. Uh... The official figures we have uh, established by the National Emergency Management Agency is that uh, 204 people have been killed, about 7,000 people have been displaced, and many of the pictures going around, uh, including the pictures being tweeted, are not pictures of the current conflict. Mm. They are pictures of previous conflicts, uh, seven or eight that have happened. Sure, and that is problematic. Uh, let me use this opportunity. That, that, is, that, is, yes, problem let, that let, is problematic when, yeah, we're, when we're covering yeah. a, a lot of issues, which is why you haven't seen many pictures during this conversation. Yeah. Governor, I'm going to take your yeah. thought online because we're, I'm going to take all of our guests online. We're right at the end of this show, but not before I just check back in with Malika. Okay, I will end with a, a tweet kind of wrapping this up. Uh, this is someone who says, I see both the herdsmen and the community at fault. You can't touch a Fulani man's cow and go free. Likewise, you can't then destroy crops and be left to leave. So what that means is that both sides are killing one another, Hadi says. All hands must be on deck to end the killings. Let me just show you the governor's Twitter page and the very top at the banner here, it says, the journey of change has begun in Kaduna State. Thank you for voting for change and welcome to a new beginning. I want to tap into the governor's thought process about what he's doing in his state 
to actually alleviate a lot of the killings and what's happening right now. Do come with us. We will be online at stream.aljazeera.com. We will continue with the governor of the state of Kaduna, Ndi Kato, and also Mohamed Bello Tukur, and hopefully you as well. Hashtag AJ Stream, be part of the conversation. We continue online. Thanks for watching, everybody. Hello everybody, welcome back. It has uh, been an interesting half an hour. Time goes really fast. There are uh, differing points of view here about what do you do about the Southern Kaduna killings. Governor, if you, if you could actually just lay out, what are you doing as governor when you have this crisis in your state? What would you say? Well, uh, uh, Femi, th uh, this is, as I said, a 36 year old problem. Yes. And in our, in, in our considered opinion, the reason why this problem has festered and escalated is impunity. Uh, people have killed in the past. People have destroyed property. No one has ever been held to account. Uh, so both sides of the divide believe that they can kill without consequence. They can destroy property without consequence. Uh, there are various mixes. Uh, why is that, Governor? How has that overlap. situation been allowed to <laughs> exist? Well, it, it, is, it is what has existed because in Nigeria, once you can hide behind the cloak of religion and ethnicity, you can pr practically get away with murder. And this has been happening. Now, this is what we've inherited. This is the first such crisis under our watch. And our approach to the problem is really uh, uh, step by step, three or four steps. The first step is first to ensure that we deploy enough military and police presence to calm down the situation and protect everyone and give everyone a feeling of safety. That's what we have been doing. We have imposed curfews over the three local governments that are affected, and we hope to maintain that until normalcy re returns. We just relax the curfew a little bit mm -hmm. to uh, just 11 hours, and this will continue. That's the first step. As soon as things normalize, we'll uh, restore uh, full freedom of movement and so on and so forth. Then we, we move on to the next step which is to punish those involved in the killings, in the destruction of property, and bring them to account. We can never have peace unless there is justice. We should not accept a situation in which, in a low-governed society, people resort to self-help or uh, re reprisal killings and so on. This is unacceptable in a civilized society. And the only way to end this cycle of violence is to prosecute those involved in these killings. And we have many arrested in custody we are arresting even more but more than that we are going after those that engage in hate speech that has encouraged and fueled this violence we are going after those that circulate false pictures uh, videos and so on that encourage this violence we are going after those that have tried to ethnicize and religionize this conflict which has led to the loss of property and loss of lives and, this and has governor happened, you I know said, i will say there the are people online who think you're going about it the right way. This is one person, this is Isa, who says, this violence has spread across many states, Zambara, Plateau, Kaduna. And sure, the government response was slow, but adequate as it stands. There's also um, a, a, a measured comment on what the government has done so far. This is from uh, the author of that Global Voices piece that we referenced at the very beginning of the show on whether or not a, a genocide was taking place in Kaduna. And this is what he told the stream. In the area of security, the government doesn't seem to have a proper and adequate intelligence gathering mechanism. So the corporates consistently walk away free, nobody is brought to book, nobody is punished, nobody is arrested, and this has gone on for years and years and has degenerated to almost a situation right now where one could say it's out of control. Currently, the government has, has spoken up and has deployed the army and security security um, outfits to the area so we are optimistic that this time around we we should you know we are optimistic and hopeful for a long lasting solution to the issue so Indy, even though he starts that comment off by saying it's almost out of control he ends it by saying we're optimistic that things are being done are you optimistic 
Well, not with some of the statements Mr. Governor is making. This is like slugging the child and telling the child to not cry. When you say you're going going after people who are trying to change it in ethnic and religious um, robes, these are people that have been dying for years. We will. You cannot control how, we will how go, people we will go after are going them. to complain. We will go after them. To how they are dying, the judge, Mr. Governor. The judge you cannot decide. say somebody who is uh, a uh, Christian has had his church burned. Who has had their homes burned the and have had several religious places, pastors dying and all that. You can come and say, well, they should not think. And they're not saying that this is a big conflict has a religious zone. That's... That, we, we, that's we, we, unheard of. Andy, you cannot say you're going Andy, to go can you hear the governor saying that we will go after them? Because people are dying for tribes that they come from. Them. I mean, it's we in Southern Kaduna. Kedmen are not attacking several uh, uh, certain tribes uh, in Southern Kaduna. I, as a woman from Southern Kaduna, can, can feel let, and express the, the fact that decide. I am dying because I come from here. And you cannot tell me, Mr. Governor, that I cannot complain about these things. I cannot explain. Express my frustration. You tell that to the you're judge, going to say you're going to arrest us for expressing our frustration. It's unheard of, Mr. Governor. I do not support that, and I don't think that that's reasonable we at will all. Arrest. That is lacking out at we, people. We will people are dying, and they are going to they yes. are going to react to dying, Mr. Governor. And those people who we, are we, dying we think that they are dying because they come from Southern Kaduna. You cannot arrest them. And for that. If those people think that they are will, dying because arrest, they are Christians, then? you cannot we arrest will, or we, try this, to shut this, them this down for that. Andy, that is bullying, Mr. Andy, Governor. Andy, let me just ask you this. Andy, give me give me a moment because we're almost at the end of this part of our program. Andy. Is it not enough that the governor says we will arrest the people who are guilty of, or the people who are believed to, to carrying out the the atrocities? Yeah. Is, that, is, that not, is that is that not enough for you? Killing. You're arresting people that are actually killing. That is, those are people you should arrest. But then people are dying. They have every right to say, "Well, this is why I think I'm dying." And your job as, as not, Mr. Governor is to we make sure everybody. that they do not die. Arrest. Well, your job, Mr. Governor, is to that, uh, make sure that we do not die. Hatred. Now we, we are not everyone. seeing that. So, Andy, under a under Andy, the governor actually coffee, expressed to us his, his plan. You Andy. cannot come and tell them not to cry or not to complain. All right, Andy, so the governor actually expressed to us his plan about what he was going to do to uh, alleviate the crisis. What is, if there was one thing that you felt would solve this situation, what would it be? One action. Mr. Governor has to be fair in ensuring justice. We, right now, we're not seeing it. We need to see him being fair. Then he needs to he needs to win the trust of the people because honestly, he knows, and we all know that he does not have the trust of the people of Southern Kaduna. Let's not even try right. to think it. So you're you're, so you're expecting to see that he action not, from the, and from the governor, from certain, Andy. And I'm moving on now because we're wrapping up the start. show. I want to get the same thought from Mahami Bello. Andy, yeah, thank you so start. much for your yeah, contribution. Let me move on to Mahami Bello. Andy, I hear you. Mohamed Bello, if there was one action that you felt would help the pastoralists that you represent, what would it be? What's the way forward from the pastoralist perspective? No, I, I think it, 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 has to go, it has to go beyond pastoralism. We have to understand that Nigeria is a multicultural and multi-religious society, and you cannot have you know, ethnic islands within Nigeria where no any other ethnic or religious group can go to. We have to learn together, to live together as a peaceful and united country. You cannot have ethnic islands in this country. Nigeria is one country, and we have to, live to, le we have to learn how to live together in peace so that we can make progress. I can't imagine that anyone would disagree with you. I'm just trying to imagine how this is going to be possible anytime soon. Malika. Well, I'll yeah, end. I think, I think uh, the government address it. Impunity, impunity, you know, impunity had reigned in the past. If we begin to reign in onto the impunity that had trespassed in the past and let people know that there is law and order and let people know that law can be enforced and let people serve sentences for whatever transgressions that they make, I think that time we will learn to live as one country. Like the governor had earlier said, People always play the religious card. People always play the ethnic card, you know, as an escape route. That should not happen in this country. Let people who commit infractions should be punished. We don't have any problem with that. Okay. Mohamed Bello, thank you. Andy Kato, thank you. Governor of the state of Kaduna, thank you so much. Malika, where do you want to leave us? Uh, well, Mohamed's last comment uh, said that we need to let people know that there's law and order. Unfortunately, there are people online who do not believe it's true as of yet. So I want to end with two comments uh, from the people's story out of this. This is Steve who tweets, Fulani herdsmen now carry AK-47s around while shepherding their cattle. We see them but there's nothing we can do speaking to the fear really uh, there's also a video comment from the other side though this is zane have a listen 
it has been devastating on the part of the Fulanis because we have cases of hatsmen who have been missing until today, we've not been able to find them. Then secondly, they've been wrongly stereotyped and stigmatized. You cannot know who your killer is until you find him. You can't know who your killer is until you find him, she says, and there are many online that hope that comes quickly. Thank you to our online community. Thank you to our guests for being part of this program. We appreciate you making time for us today. Take care, everybody.